Hello and welcome. I'm talking to Amitabh Dubey, who handles research and communications for the Congress Party. Is that a fair description? Or? Yeah, I handle research in, in the Re communications research in the communications yeah. party. But your background is financial analysis, political analysis, and you gave up, is it fair to say, a lucrative career in the private sector to do this? That's right. I uh, saw what was happening in the country, and uh, like many people, I was very outraged by the yeah. direction the country was going in. So in 2017, I joined the Professionals Congress, which Shashi Tharoor had set up. And that big, that was my journey in the Congress uh, five years ago, six years ago, and seven years ago. And it's a point worth making that the Congress really doesn't have much money, so nobody's paying you to do this. No, no, no. Most of us are uh, sacrificing something financially to do what we're doing. So why are you doing it? Because, well, A, I have the opportunity. Not yeah. everyone gets the opportunity to yes. do this. So I have the opportunity to do this. And B, you know, I've worked for many years. I do have savings. Um, so I can also afford to do it. If I was just setting off in my career, it would be very difficult. And okay. I'm not in the stage where I'm fighting elections, so it's not like I have to worry about uh, financing large amounts of money. So, so it's something that the professional functions of the party, it's a good fit for me. That's unusual no, in Indian politics. What, it's happening more in the Congress now than anywhere else. Yeah, It's happening, I think, in many parts of the political system. Uh, one area it is happening, has been happening for some years, is the political consultancies that are now, that have come out, the ecosystem that's developed around elections. Hmm. So starting with Prashant Kishore and the Congress Party. Yeah, but we these have, guys all take money. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah all, they all they, take they, money. They're yeah. all very profitable. Yeah. I'm saying I mean, that fact yeah. that people like you are willing to do this and yeah. give up well-paid jobs, it's yeah. unusual. Yeah, 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 it is. Yeah? It is. Okay, so now that you're here, we've got you here, I want to talk a bit about what the Congress's strategy is. Because apparently on the 22nd, you're going to get out enforcement directed offices and you're going to ask about SEBI and all the stuff that's happened. Now, there's already been preceding the active agitation, much criticism from the BJP that you are, what you're really out to do is to damage the Indian economy. The vice president of India said in a speech that he was very upset that constitutional functionaries, no names taken, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, were out to damage the Indian economy. So that's an allegation I think the Congress will have to defend itself against. So just explain to me what you're doing. Here. So, you know, it's a pattern that the BJP has adopted for many years of wrapping itself around the flag to cover up illegalities, fraud, its, um, you know, the actions it takes that are against the values of the Constitution. It's an old right-wing trope. Uh, I think a serious senior figure like the vice president should think very carefully about what they say. Because if you are saying that the Congress party is destabilizing Indian markets, are you also saying that the Supreme Court, that in response to the Hindenburg allegations in January 2023, set up an ex ex expert committee to look into it and to monitor the SEBI investigation into many of these allegations. And if you look at the Supreme Court's direction to the to SEBI and to the expert mm -hmm. committee, so look into violations of Rule 19A of the Securities Act, it is whether there were violations of related party requirements. Many of the things that the Hindenburg report repeated, now I say repeated because many of these allegations were already out there. Hindenburg packaged it into a uh, short seller's product and it had a market impact. Uh -huh. I'm going to stop you. You're saying that what Hindenburg said in that first report was not really that new? Much of it was procured from uh, newspapers, uh, open sources that, uh, you know, over the years, uh, newspapers and media have been writing about this thing. Uh, whistleblowers have revealed many of these details. Uh, they got some more details themselves through their own research, but a lot of it was already available. I didn't realize that. Now, the allegation against Hindenburg also was, apart from the George Soros kind of wild conspiracy theory, is that they were doing this to make money by driving down the Indian markets by shorting these stocks. Is that a fair allegation? Yes, it's, it's not an allegation, it's a description. A, Hindenburg themselves said that's what they were going yeah. to do. Now, SEBI has, to the Supreme Court, SEBI has said, and this is in the Supreme Court judgment, that short selling is a desirable and essential part of Indian markets because it creates liquidity and it fights mispricing of assets, which can be uh, overpriced on many occasions in the stock markets. So, uh, SEBI, for the benefit yeah. of lay people, what is short selling? Short selling is when you, if I want to go long, which is I want to buy, most people think about buying stocks with right. the hope that they will go up in price. But if I believe that the price is overvalued and the price is likely to go down when everyone figures out that it's overvalued, I will borrow stocks and I will sell them with the, and 
expectation that I will buy them back and this net transaction, if the price goes down, will result in profit to me. So that is short selling. It is the borrowing of stock and the selling and then purchasing it back when the value is lower. And if the value is higher, then you lose money. So there's still a risk that your bet goes so, wrong. So, I mean, so again, in lay people term, if the stock is at 100, yeah, you say you will sell at 100 or whatever, confident by the time you're ready to sell, you're, you have to sell, the price will actually be 70. Yeah, and when you make by the time you buy back. By the time you buy yeah, back, yeah. you'll make. Okay, and then so that, short sale. that difference is your profit. Why does uh, Supreme Court, why does SEBI think this is good for the market? So, because what it does is that it creates liquidity because every transaction needs someone else at the other end. If right. I buy, you need someone who's willing to sell. So this process adds to liquidity and makes markets more active. So if you have an illiquid market, and one of the SEBI, one of the Adani allegations is that they created illiquidity, they created an illusion of liquidity by getting third parties to own stock that in effect Adani owned. Okay. Um, so if you have a liquid market, you get an accurate price dis uh, discovery process because there'll be a bunch of buyers, there'll be a bunch of okay. sellers, and you get a price. If you have illiquid markets, then price rigging is a very easy thing to do. Okay, so I get that. Now, so these guys said they were shorting Adani stock, right? Hindenburg. And in fact, Adani share prices did go down in a res uh, as a response to that report. The Supreme Court, as I understand it, asked SEBI for a report on what was happening. Is that correct? Take the story out. Yeah. So as a result of this market volatility, the stocks went down, then they recovered later. And these very serious allegations, uh, the Supreme Court set up an expert committee of six people headed by a judge. And they asked them to do a report and find out what was going on and to get SEBI to finish its inquiries. SEBI was given. Now, this is where the current issue over yeah. the SEBI chairman becomes relevant. SEBI was given two months to wrap up its investigation in 24 matters relating to things like insider trading, violation of securities laws, and so on. I want to flag here that this, these capital markets allegations are only one part of what we as a party believe is the Adani mega scam, which has many other components. Okay. So Hindenburg allegations are only one part of it. So that's just the background. Now, SEBI was given two months to do this uh, report in 24 matters, as I said. Um, in August, in May, they got an extension. And in August, they said that, listen, we have done 22 out of 24. We need more time. So the Supreme Court said, OK, fine. Take some more time, but wrap it up as soon as you mm -hmm. can. Now, 18 months later, we still do not have closure into all of these issues. So a two-month pro process that was expected to take two months has now taken 18 months, it still hasn't closed. And SEBI has said that one matter out of the 24 remains to be closed. Okay. And that matter is likely, we don't know for sure, because it could be one of two matters. And that matters probably the violation of Article 19A, which is the minimum public shareholding requirement, which would be violated if Adani had Benami ownership of stock in, that, in its own companies through all these opaque funds that we've all talked about and read about. Which is the allegation? Right? The allegation is that Adani's own money is coming back through funds registered abroad and that therefore the, this is shown as public ownership. It's not really public ownership because it's taking his own money back. Is that fair? That's correct. And that violates the public trust because A, it violates rules because a company should be delisted if it crosses a threshold of ownership, right. uh, which means taken off the market because it's not a safe stock for the average investor to invest in. And B, it's a violation of the rules anyway. That means then punishment yeah. has to be uh, But done. to be fair, I mean, we should say in the interest of fairness that Adani has completely denied this allegation yes. and said that he does not control these entities that are investing. That's correct. That's right. But there's been a lot of whistleblowers, a lot of documents have come out that are very suggestive of this. And we believe they have to be investigated fully, which is why we have been calling for a joint parliamentary committee. Okay. Uh, so to just go back to this... Uh, what we were talking about, yeah. the SEBI process. So the SEBI process has taken an inordinate long amount of time. Now, everyone gave them benefit of the doubt until it emerged very recently that there were some severe conflicts of interest um, that the SEBI chairperson herself has been found to have. Um, the most shocking of these has, of course, been the, the, the revelation that she and her husband were invested in an opaque offshore fund not just similar to, but actually directly related to the similar off offshore funds that people close to Adani are, are accused of having used to launder money back into Indian stocks. 
to violate the securities laws. So all of a sudden, what seemed like an inordinately long process, which of course was very convenient for the ruling establishment because we went through the elections without any closure on this issue. Suddenly this coincidence looks like there may be more to it. And this is what needs to be investigated very thoroughly. You know, there's a, everyone says Caesar's wife has to be above suspicion. Yeah. And in this case, that clearly is not the case. There are some other conflicts of interest that are not directly related to the Adani group, whereas to do with real estate investment trusts, to do with some of the consulting firms. But from, from our point of view, the critical question mark is about the relationship with the funds that were investing Adani, alleged Adani money back into the Adani group. Okay, so when it comes to financial matters, I'm a bit of an idiot. So let me give you an idiot's okay. perspective. You've said that a lot of opaque funds from abroad invest in Adani companies. Probably, possibly, allegedly, these funds are actually controlled by the Adanis. And that is how now they've violated the requirement of certain public ownership or proportion of public ownership. SEPI is investigating that, was given two months originally to investigate it. 18 months later, no report has come because SEBI says of the 24 matters, it was asked to investigate one or two are still pending. And you think it's possible it is this aspect of the allegations that is pending. While this discussion has gone on, it has now been revealed by Hindenburg that the SEBI chairperson actually had investments in one of these entities, if not directly connected to Adani, certainly an entity in which people connected to Adani had also invested for these purposes. Is that the allegation? That's right. And the allegation is also that these were among the vehicles used to bypass Indian securities regulations. Yeah. Uh, so it's a very disturbing proximity. Okay. From what I've read, her defense is that these investments were made before she became part of SEBI, that she liquidated those investments, and that therefore this is just history and has no bearing on what she's done at SEBI. Well, the the, the fact is that the, she personally disassociated herself from yep. the investments that then her husband was handling. And now there is evidence that she was actually conducting the transactions through her email account, even when she was a member, not chairman, but a member of SEBI in 2018, okay. which then shows that this so-called Chinese wall may not have been uh, what it was claimed it was. So your, the basis of your allegation, the brunt of your allegation, is that SEBI was asked to investigate the charge that Adani was investing in his own companies through opaque funds. But SEBI could not be expected to conduct such an investigation because the chairperson of SEBI was in herself connected to those funds through investments and through other ways. Is, so, that, so the question, is that your charge? Yeah. So, it's not a charge. It is a huge question mark. You have to okay. keep in mind that SEBI is a vehicle. It is a repository of public trust. Um, it is the institution that underpins these huge markets on which 10 crore, there are now 10 crore uh, unique investors in Indian stock markets, DMAT accounts, right. which means there are uh, 10 crore households, 50 crore individuals, if you take an average, are dependent on financial markets and they trust these markets. They put their life savings into these markets. So SEBI has so far been seen as a rock solid regulator. With these questions, there are now many doubts that need to be explained. And also keep in mind that SEBI's own at approach towards financial market regulation has been very strict. There are huge penalties and there are very strict rules about how fund managers can invest their money. Uh, fund managers have to put in a certain amount of their own money into their own funds so their, their own incentives are aligned. If they do other transactions, they have to get approval. Um, you know, one of the defenses has been that the, the, some of these investments by the chairperson was made on the advice of a friend. Uh, who, An old school friend of her husband's. Old apparently. school friend of her husband's, who, by the way, it turns out was an Adani group director at some point. Okay. So there is that. Um, but keep in mind that Deep Industries is one case of insider trading that SEBI investigated. And they decided one of the reasons this insider trading was proved is because the accused had liked each other's Facebook posts. And that shows that they knew each other and they were friends. Mm. So if a Facebook like is good enough to indict someone as an insider trader, then you know, what? how can you not uh, uh, be, be upfront about all of these other much deeper connections? And if you have been upfront internally, you have to be able to show that it affected your decision making, that you recused yourself from critical decisions uh, past SEBI chairpersons have recused themselves. The first 
uh, SEBI chairperson, was a uh, former UTI person. He had 50 SPI shares. He sold those shares so that there would be no conflict of interest, M. Damodaran. C.B. Bhave, was, who became uh, subsequently the SEBI chairperson, he was involved, he was the head of NSDL, which is the financial corporation. He recused himself completely from all matters pertaining to NSDL and a committee was set up to look into any business or any investigation relating to that firm. So did the chairperson do anything like that? Did she recuse herself? There is no evidence that she did. She may have, and it would be very nice if Sebi could show to us, because as I said, Caesar's wife has to yeah. be above reproach. Um, we know that the Sebi chairperson met Gautam Adani himself twice in 2022, during a period when these investigations were going on. So there are many these questions. These were like private meetings? Or they were these just were, at a function? The, or what? No, these were meetings uh, to discuss matters. I'm not privy to who was there. But the fact is that she was front and center of these investigations. So there was no question of recusing herself. So the question is that, you know, what we want to know is how has SEBI's integrity been preserved through this period with all of these important questions that are being raised. And you want a JPC to look into this? Yeah. So the JPC, as I mentioned, there are many, there are four or five aspects of what we call the Adani mega scam. Okay. One is the capital market side of it, the allegation of money laundering, um, power equipment and coal over invoicing with the money taken out and brought back in through some of these vehicles, including the vehicles that we've been talking about, and so on and so forth. Violations of securities laws. But there is an arguably bigger scandal. Um, there is the use of uh, the prime minister's building of a monopoly of capital, a, mono a political power monopoly buttressed by a big capital using. ED, CBI, income tax, agencies of the state to force critical assets into the hands of his close friends through raids if necessary. Um, NDTV gets raided, Adani takes over. Uh, Mumbai airport owners get raided, Adani takes over. Uh, Krishna Patnam port gets raided, ends up with Adani. There are six, seven such examples of critical infrastructure assets that have made their way into the Adani group after raids by ED, CBI, income tax, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, just as a footnote, these are the same agencies that were used to raise funds for the BJP during the electoral bond scam, which was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. So this is an old pattern that we have seen in the last few years of concentration of power by the Prime Minister around himself, not just the BJP, but you know himself, um, uh, in a way that distorts both the business environment, distorts India's politics, and has, in our view, been the biggest corruption scandal of independent India. Relatedly, there's another scandal, how India's foreign policy has been used to enrich the PM's close friends. I'll give you an example. In Bangladesh, we know what's been happening in Bangladesh yes. uh, recently. In Bangladesh, in 2012, the UPA government, as a gesture of friendship to Bangladesh, set up an NTPC, public sector, 1320 megawatt power plant in Bangladesh. Um, to, because Bangladesh obviously needed the electricity. In 2016 or 2015, the Prime Minister Modi himself said, okay, we're going to help Bangladesh. How are we going to do it? Adani will set up a power plant in Goda, Jharkhand. Now, Jharkhand is a coal surplus state. It will be fueled by imported coal from Australia, Adani coal, um, coming in Adani ships into an Adani port, into an Adani power plant. And this power will be sold to Bangladesh. And allegedly, five times what other plants in Bangladesh were producing. It's a newer plant, so maybe it will be more expensive, but five times is, is a big, big gap. And this was very controversial in Bangladesh. Yeah. So the question is, are the actions of the Prime Minister, um, did they cause more trouble for Sheikh Hasina? And perhaps in some way contribute to the outcome we have seen, uh, the focus on enriching your own friend. And just as a, a, a footnote here, the Indian citizen was also um, paying for this particular project. Uh, the uh, plant was declared a special economic zone uh, and the rules did not allow a power plant to become a special economic zone so the rules were changed mm -hmm. over the opposition of many officials. Jharkhand had a policy that one fourth of all electricity from a plant in our state would be sold at a discounted rate to our own consumers. That policy was changed over the objections of many officials and would have cost according to Jharkhand government calculations 7500 crores to the Jharkhand consumer over a 25 year period. So what I'm saying is, here the Prime Minister pushed a project that not only caused problems in Bangladesh, 
but they also were against the interests of Indian electricity consumers. And again, I, I can get into the details, but they have oh, these policies have led to an increase in the price of electricity. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the coal that came from Indonesia to Gujarat, that fed into high electricity prices when the price of the coal miraculously went up yeah. 50%. The FT has, I can talk about Sri Lanka also. So the third bucket is the misuse of India's foreign policy to enrich the PM's close friends. So the Adani close mega friends scam. friends or is this only about Adani? It is his, his one and best friend. Yeah, it's yeah. about Adani. Yeah, it yeah. is Adani, yes. Basically. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, the allegation again from the BJP is that you've picked on Adani because you know he has a historical relationship with the Prime Minister and you think you can embarrass the Prime Minister with that. And in your pursuit of political advantage or in, adva in embarrassing the Prime Minister, you're actually endangering India's reputation, India's economy, India's markets. And as the White President and various people said, you're destabilizing the economy. But what is actually endangering Indian markets, India's image, India's reputation is this blatant cronyism in support of one business group. Did he go to Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and other countries and say, you know, there will be an Indian project and we will look at all the potential Indian companies that can build it and we'll bid out to the right one. That does not seem to have happened. Uh, the use of EDCVR income tax, has he been driving assets into other companies' hands? No, he hasn't. This is a misuse of taxpayer funded agencies. Um, who have a sovereign duty to work for the Indian public are now working for the Prime Minister and his best friend. So if the BJP and if others want to defend this, in some way they're welcome to do that. And when justice is done, it'll become clear, uh, ka or pani ka pani, as they say. The view that the BJP espouses is that while the BJP is pro-capitalist and pro-growth and pro, I think the phrase is employment creators, you guys are essentially socialists people who want to redistribute income, redistribute wealth, maybe not take away Mangal Sutras and buffaloes from people, but certainly try and cripple the economy by hobbling the operations of big industrialists who are actually crucial to India's growth. Is that fair? Let's look at the facts. The facts are that private investment during the UP period was higher than it's been under Modi. Uh, Modi has is that been true? For, yes. The proportion of private investment as a percent of GDP is lower today and has been lower under Modi than it was under the UPA, okay. which is why the government has been forced to step up public investment, uh, government funded investment to make it up. And the finance minister and other people have been constantly urging the private sector to invest and saying, you know, we don't know, we're doing so much for them. We don't know why they're uh, not investing. And maybe they should think about why that might be, because if you're sending raids to every businessman, you're making tax demands. Recently, the, the number of GST demands and GST related raids has gone up. It's been in the news. Yeah. Um, uh, 8,000 Indian dollar millionaires leave the country every year to Dubai, Singapore, London. They've all moved out. We know that. Um, there must be a reason they've all moved out. So I think this, this uh, attempt to create this rhetoric, this writing rhetoric, is at odds with the actual actions of this government, which are, which are anti-business and, more importantly, anti-competitive. Um, I think everyone would agree that you need competitive markets sure. um, for good outcomes. Um, and what we've seen under this government is a relentless concentration of power in large monopolies. Um, Viral Acharya, who was the Deputy Reserve Bank Governor, was appointed during the Modi government, yeah. has written a paper where he's shown that the five biggest groups, the, the increased concentration of economic power defined both as sales and as assets in the top five groups, has led to an increase in prices of the goods that those people produce because of a reduction in competition. So clearly, Increased monopolization is anti-consumer. So the people who are actually attacking the consumers directly are now painting them, you know, wrapping themselves in a flag and trying to sell to the people the idea that the Congress party is in some mm. way undermining this when it is us who are trying to defend the consumer and defend the voter against this relentless monopolization. What about the Prime Minister's allegation that you guys are overly socialistic, that he made this again and again, and we gave it a communal twist, but he made the basic allegation in every speech pretty much that you will take things away from ordinary people, you will give them to other people. Is that a fair summary of your political, of no. your political economics? No, of course not. What, what is ironic is that through the policies that I just described, monopolization, yeah. handing over assets to uh, Adani, um, They've caused an increase, for instance, in electricity prices. Gujarat electricity prices in one year went up 102%. Airport 
there's an airports monopoly. Yeah. He handed six airports over to Adani in Mangalore and in Lucknow. The user development fee that all of us who fly uh, went up from 150 rupees to 750 rupees. So monopolies lead to price increase. So what he's doing is gouging consumers through monopoly. Um, by uh, having a high GST, he's ripping off everyone in the country who's paying 18% for essential goods. So the poor are paying these heavy taxes. What we are talking about is how we, and by the way, this is a global conversation. This is not a Congress party conversation okay. in India. It's a conversation in Brazil, it's a conversation in Europe, it's a conversation in the United States. That when you have these billionaires who, whose valuation, whose wealth has gone up so high because of stock market valuation, while others, you know, unemployment is a problem, uh, inflation is a problem. Um, can you tap into the wealthiest people and get them somehow to subsidize the people at the bottom? So this is a conversation we want to have. Uh, it was but when you're saying yeah. the wealthiest people, you don't mean uh, executive. You don't mean executive from the middle class. No, you mean not. a oligarch. Yeah, or a yeah we're talking about people, you know, who make hundreds of crores. And this is a conversation. We have not. This was not in our manifesto. Yeah, um, <clears throat> we think it's good to have a conversation about it. Our manifesto is about taking money and giving it to the people at the bottom of the pyramid. Consumption growth has slowed down to record levels. Normally, consumption growth in an economy keeps up with GDP growth, more or less. Yeah. Today, consumption growth is half of that. So even as the economy is growing at a certain rate, people are not able to keep up their consumption. So this shows that there's a huge amount of distress. You know, all of these issues were litigated during the election. We saw the result of the election that there was a lot of traction for our narrative. This but is not, to be fair, yeah. he still got more seats than you. Of course he did. Yeah. But, and one reason was that this particular, the biggest scam in independent India was dragged on and on. The investigation went on and on. If it had, if the report had come out on time as the Supreme Court had asked, then perhaps we would have had a different, different outcome. But, you know, it worked very conveniently for the government. But it goes beyond election results. See, an election is an opportunity for the people of India to judge a government. Clearly, all the facts were not in front of the voter yeah. relating to the Adani so, uh, scam. Had they been, maybe we would have had a different outcome. But anyway, that is but speculation. He didn't send you guys tempos as the Prime Minister alleged during the campaign? No, I think he, he made all sorts of accusations, none of which he has bothered to investigate. Um, and then he went and uh, went off to the wedding of one of the people he accused of sending tempos. So this is a very odd way of showing disapproval of corruption, is alleged corruption, is to, uh, you know, to, to, to socialize with the people you just made an accusation a few months ago. Okay. So, is the ca caricature that the middle class would lose out if the Congress came to power accurate? Not at all. If you look at our manifesto, it was very clear we would have a direct taxes code, we would have a stable tax regime. Um, and in fact, who is it who has been trying to make, you know, it's very ironic given what happened in the recent budget that they were accusing us of socialism, when in fact this whole indexation business um, and capital gains taxation um, uh, angered the middle class greatly and caused this huge revolt that that forced them to back down slightly not completely but but you know they're only back very slightly only on very the index slightly, of, yeah. and, of real yeah, estate of real estate. if you opted for a different scheme or something yeah. exactly exactly so yeah. i think this has been a very anti-middle class government it has taken the middle class for granted because they believe that the earlier development narrative and then more recently their religious um narrative would take care of the middle class and middle class was in the bag you know yeah. we don't have to worry about them we can squeeze them as much as they want but now they're going to have to think about it again. Um, that actually you may want to deliver some benefits for the middle class if you want their votes. You think that will happen? Will there be a cost correction? Because so far, despite middle class anger after the budget, there's been virtually nothing. Look, as, as a taxpayer, I hope there's a yeah. cost correction, right? Uh, but we know that uh, Mr. Modi, once he's set on a, a course, he's, he's not a modest man. He thinks he has all the answers. And he tends not to correct costs. Because now he has fewer seats. He has to... Uh, uh, bring his allies uh, part of the picture. So we have to see where it goes. But, uh, but I hope the government... But do you uh, think he will take any action in the SEBI matter? Or he'll just uh, clamp down and say, do your worst, I'll, I'm not making any changes in SEBI? I think whatever action they take on SEBI, at this point of time, the Supreme Court needs to step in. Um, we don't have any trust in the government. Our faith in SEBI has been shaken. I would say by these revelations pending a satisfactory resolution and the Supreme Court has the power to either hand over the investigation to the CBI or a special investigative team which would be a little more arm's length from yeah. from from where we've been so far 
Um, but fundamentally, we believe that this is a JPC. This is, this is a matter that requires a joint parliamentary committee. The reason is that the matter that SEBI is investigating and that the CBI or SIT would investigate is one chunk, the capital market slice. But we have to look at the crony capitalism slice. We have to look at the misuse of foreign policy slice. We have to look at how uh, you know various leases of uh, ports that were given to um, Adani previously in Gujarat. Suddenly those leases have miraculously been extended from 50 to 75 years. Um, all of these kinds of actions don't fall within the remit of the expert committee and SEBI and whoever replaces SEBI if they do. So we need a JPC to investigate the full scope of the Adani mega scam. Do you think this issue will take off and will resonate with uh, voters? I think voters are, when you talk to people, I think most people are aware. The opinion polls also show very mixed opinions on the Adani thing. And in fact, I, if I recall, the majority of people actually think something wrong happened uh, with, the, uh, with, with, with all of this Adani stuff. Um, and the, the, the misuse of the investigative agency is widely understood as something that the Modi government no, I does. think on the misuse of investigative agencies, yeah. I think people accept that this is now yeah. a fact of life. But the Adani stuff, I'm not sure how much traction it has. It is, to some extent, it is slightly abstract, these uh, matters to do with markets. But I think people are understanding that there is a special relationship between the Prime Minister and Adani, and that this has led to benefits that other groups have not enjoyed, that he's a privileged person given their history. And once a proper investigation is done and all the facts come forth, I think it will be very clear to the people of India that something very wrong has been done and that this is in fact the biggest corruption scandal in independent India's history. So that's why we have... You're calling it a corruption scandal without actually alleging that the Prime Minister has benefited in any way. All you're able to allege is that Adani has benefited, which may or may not be true. But it doesn't prove that the Prime Minister has personally benefited. Well, let me put it this way. There was... There are some cases, um, you know, in the bureaucracy, I'll answer this indirectly, where a bureaucrat doesn't do anything questionable for many years. And right at the end, they do that one deal that takes care of mm. retirement. So there are different ways that corruption can be done in this country. Uh, but I think that you don't need to show a direct flow of funds into someone's pocket. What you need to show is that something uh, there's been a conflict of interest, that it was improper, and that this is something that does not behoove a prime minister to do. And that, I think, uh, will make it clear to the people of India, if it's not already clear, mm. that um, the entire focus of this government has been to benefit one businessman at all costs, at the cost of our relationships with our neighbors, at the cost of uh, financial market stability, at the cost of the business environment. They keep talking about ease of doing business, but there's only ease of doing business for one group. Uh, things are just getting more difficult for most of the other people. So uh, so I feel that once the facts are in front of people, and many of them are, it'll be very clear to the Indian voter and the Indian citizen that something very, very wrong has happened here. And you guys are going to keep hammering away at this? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's our job as the opposition to keep hammering, and uh, we will do it and raise all the other issues. That and SEBI be. is just one part of it. Yeah, absolutely. The SEBI is the capital markets part of it. There's the, um, the, the, the misuse of government machinery, there's a the misuse of foreign policy, there's the misuse of all the regulations. Um, all of that needs to be investigated. Okay, let's see how it goes. Amitabh Dubey, thank you very much. Thank you.